Thank you for the very generous introduction. It's a privilege to be here. I have to begin with two obvious apologies. First of all, I was told never to speak after the guitar player. Um, <laughs> following that, music is uh, quite a challenge. And I'm also genuinely um, eager to make it clear that in contrast to the previous two speakers from whom I've learned a lot, I'm not an actual practitioner in the field. Um, I don't do local work, although I've now been given a number of things to think about. Everybody does local work, and so my disclaimer is obviously a little bit inaccurate. My big goal, particularly over the past uh, couple decades, has been to use history education, and frankly, particularly world history education, uh, to advance greater understanding of societies other than our own, and hopefully in the process to encourage students to uh, expand the kind of knowledge that will create better global citizens and more peaceful practitioners. Uh, and that's the kind of tack that I want to take in my remarks today. Uh, my focus is on, I guess, dignity as an element of policy, particularly foreign policy and most particularly American foreign policy. I don't think I'm contradicting at all the two previous uh, presenters but I am taking a somewhat different approach, and the questions in the previous session raised the issue of politics, and I guess I want to address the issue of politics a little more directly. Um, two possible approaches were worth considering in preparing for these remarks. I want to mention the one that I didn't take because it could be exploited more widely, and you may end up deciding I should have done that one rather than the one I will emphasize. It's certainly possible to use world history to provide um, moving examples of statements on behalf of human dignity in the past. Um, all of the great world religions, after all, introduced new principles of spiritual equality, which are fundamental to any conception of human dignity. I could cite a uh, Chinese spokesperson at the end of the 15th century uh, who somewhat startlingly spoke of the possibility now of, for the first time uh, embracing an era of, of humanity. And of course one could cite the origins of human rights thinking in the West in the 18th century and the role it has played in improving our sense of human dignity. And one could provide examples of not only spokespeople but practitioners. Uh, the Emperor Akbar, for example, in the Mughal dynasty in India um, after a period of bellicosity, uh, embraced peace, embraced tolerance, and had some really interesting things to say and some very interesting policies. They were short-lived, unfortunately, but one could do, in other words, a history that would provide reinforcement for the importance of human dignity as a factor in peaceful human relations, and I would urge more attention to that. That is not, however, the tack that I want to emphasize. What I decided would be most useful would be to raise three aspects of world history that pose some obvious challenges to the greater employment of dignity in human affairs and particularly dignity in foreign relations. Um, the first point is a very simple one and I won't belabor it because it's pretty obvious. World history provides a distressing number of examples of how easy it is for human beings uh, to demean the other, to identify foreignness and strangeness with inferiority, with fear. It was the ancient Greeks whom we esteem in so many ways who after all introduced the word barbarian. It, it represented simply their sense of what foreign languages sounded like in Athens. It sounded like everybody was going around saying bar, 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 hence the word barbarian. Um, I think we should be returning, just to jump from that point to the present, I think we should be returning in our discussion to the, to the point that Donna Hicks has made that we live today uh, in a pandemic of indignity. If that's the case, and it may well be, we're doing something seriously wrong and we need to address it, certainly on the personal level, but possibly also on the more general level. I've been inspired in 
the other two challenges I want to turn to by a sense of the two closely related reasons that we should be encouraging more attention to human dignity in international relations. The first reason has been abundantly presented to you, and I will simply reiterate, the first reason is obviously that human beings have a, an equal worth enshrined in human rights, and that equal worth get, needs to be expressed in terms of appreciation of the dignity of every, every human being. Dr. Akeda has been cited many times. Let me add one additional quote. Human rights issues must not only be debated actively among governments, we must establish a shared global culture of human rights that is rooted in the realities of daily life and based on an unfailing and uncompromising respect for human dignity. My guess is everybody in the room agrees with that, and it's really an important goal. It's an important thought. It should inspire our approach to relationships with societies other than our own. But the second point that I want to emphasize is a utilitarian one. As the United States was preparing to invade Iraq in 2003, uh, the former National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Zbigniew Brzezinski um, said very simply, you remember we were going in both to rid the world of weapons of mass destruction, which turned out not to be there, and we were going to provide freedom for the Iraqis. Brzezinski was very skeptical of our effort, properly skeptical as things turned out, and he argued as against the second goal that probably if you look at the world around us, people are more interested in dignity than in liberty. That remark made a profound impression on me. I don't mean to say that I can prove that it's right, though I actually guess it is. But the extent to which we have a foreign policy that is too often negligent of the importance of dignity in other individuals and in other societies, something it seems to me something that we should be addressing rather carefully. And in, in so doing, I'd like to suggest in addition to the general challenge of the tremendous human impulse to scorn others and to belabor strangeness and to reinforce feelings of self-worth by self-worth by running down other societies, in addition to that point, Two other challenges strike me as worth discussing. One will be familiar to you, and I won't belabor it unduly. The other is a lot more complicated, and I'm going to try to present it, and I'll be very interested in your reactions. Okay, the first one. We're, uh, we are, at best, barely emerging in world history from over two centuries in which Western society for quite a period of time, rather systematically degraded and downgraded every other society in the world. Uh, the impulse began um, with the voyages of discovery, but it was intensified around the middle of the 18th century, ironically, at precisely the same period at which other Western thinkers were generating some of the key ideas in human rights doctrine, it was embellished around 1750 as Westerners found or believed they found that they were A, militarily superior to virtually every other society in the world, B, technological, technologically superior to virtually, other, virtually every other society in the world, and they were beginning to think maybe they were also politically superior to every other society in the world. So by the middle of the 18th century, you have uh, a series of systematic statements of Western claims of superiority over China, which, by the way, was not at that point accurate, but accuracy was not really the measure of the statement. Uh, you had the beginnings of that uh, long-standing idea of the Ottoman Empire as the, quote, sick man of Europe, and scholars have actually, I think, persuasively argued that in 1750, the Ottoman Empire was actually running along pretty well. Uh, you have, obviously, uh, European statements of superior, superiority over African societies from which they were deriving slaves. Um, and this pattern, and again, I won't belabor it because you know the, the broad outlines here, this pattern continued uh, essentially unchecked well into the 20th century. It was embellished in the 19th century by more systematic racism. 
It was exacerbated by misinterpretations of Darwinian theory to argue that there should be some sort of survival of the fittest struggle among different societies, and obviously the West was best and would end up on top. But the point is, is very simple. For over two centuries, Westerners sought to convince themselves and actively told other people with whom they were interacting that the West was the measure of all things and all other societies fell short. This is relevant still um, to discussions of human rights today because in dealing with, of human dignity today, and in dealing with issues of dignity today, we face something of a legacy of sensitivity in a number of other societies, which is very difficult, I think, for Americans fully to appreciate. I mean, we didn't say those things. The tenor of world discourse has probably improved a bit. Blatant statements of systematic non-Western inferiority are much less common than they are, than, than, than they used to be. But we still, in dealing with issues of dignity in the world at large, we still face a world that is quite understandably sensitive to implications of um, residues of Western claims of superiority. And if we don't take that sensitivity into account, it doesn't mean we can never disagree with other societies. It doesn't mean that we have to abase ourselves. But if we don't take that sensitivity into account, we will probably not successfully uh, use dignity as a positive force in international relations and in our foreign policy. Okay? And then, as you all know, um, and I won't deal at great length with this one either, but we can return to it in discussion. As you all know, while this systematic dialogue of Western superiority is now unfashionable, we face in the United States, in some ways rather oddly, over the past couple of decades, a new particularly American effort to insert the primacy of so-called American exceptionalism as a new way in which the United States will measure its relations with other societies. I assume, frankly, the, the, the term American exceptionalism, by the way, dates back only to 1939. Uh, it was first used by Joseph Stalin, but I, I won't go into that one. Um, uh, now, the, in, in fairness, the United States had talked about manifest destiny, it had talked about components that can go into American exceptionalism. But the term itself is surprisingly recent. I think it reflects our experience over the past couple decades as a society under attack. It reflects our nervousness about globalization. Um, and it can be a doctrine that is conceivably acceptable and compatible with human dignity around the world. When President Obama was pressed to ask whether he believed in American exceptionalism, which now apparently is a litmus for a successful national politician, he replied that he did believe in American exceptionalism, but also added, and I think this is very much to his credit, and of course I assume that Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism and Russians believe in Russian, and if you do it that way, that's terrific. Okay? In other words, any society can legitimately point to some distinctive features, presumably some good, some bad, that are slightly different to the features of other societies. And if we grant the possibility that every society can make those claims, we're in business. But that obviously is not what American exceptionalists primarily claim. They primarily claim that America is different from every other society in the world and distinctively superior. So they're taking what used to be a Western argument and converting it to a narrow nationalist argument, and it is incompatible with a successful American approach to the dignity of peoples around the world. It is spreading in our educational system. It is dangerous, and... Um, we need to figure out, and it's not an easy task, we need, need to figure out ways to um, defuse it. So challenge number one was the extent to which any effort to push the importance of human dignity as a core component of a successful policy in international relations faces huge historical barriers. We are, in arguing for a higher place for human dignity in foreign policy, we are essentially arguing that we can do better than societies used to do. And for an historian, that's a very difficult claim. I'll come back to it at the end. But we are arguing that we need to figure out 
how we can do better than history. Okay? The second point about systematic claims of Western superiority and now systematic claims of American superiority is a second challenge, uh, very difficult to deal with because it involves recasting our own approaches and it involves a, a, a particular awareness of the sensitivity of peoples in other parts of the world. That's a very difficult challenge also. But this is the challenge that I assume Brzezinski was talking about when he argued that human dignity was probably a greater concern of peoples around the world than conventional human freedom. He was arguing that we need to figure out how to redress now a considerable legacy of inferiority or claims of inferiority that continue to motivate policy in China, okay, continue to motivate policy in Russia, okay. We, um, there are obviously a number of issues in contemporary Russian policy and uh, I won't pretend to uh, assess all of them, but one of the issues is uh, involves the extent to which we jumped on uh, a gleeful statement of Russian inferiority in their um, transition from communism in the 1990s. We did not appreciate their need for dignity as we should have, and we've created a greater set of difficulties for ourselves than we otherwise confront. Dignity is a utilitarian as well as an idealistic issue. All right. And here's the third area I want to address. Now, I've been thinking about this for a while. I think part of this will probably seem pretty reasonable. Part of it, I can, I can express my sense of concern, but I don't quite know my way out. So this is my third challenge, uh, in addition to the sheer difficulty of the task historically, in addition to the problem of addressing Western and American claims of superiority, this is my third challenge. We have a problem in appropriately combining interest in human dignity with interest in human rights, okay? Now, in the best of all worlds, they go together. So in the best of all worlds, we have no problem at all. And Dr. Ikeda has been eloquent, obviously, in his accurate association of rights and dignity. But we got two problems. They're, they're, they're part of the same issue, but let me phrase them uh, distinctly because I think they raise different levels of difficulty. Problem number one, and this is where my guess is most of us will agree, though, but though I'm, I'm, I welcome your expressions of concern. Problem number one involves a, at least a recent tendency to exploit the right of freedom of expression to needlessly discourteous and insulting symbolic statements about other societies, okay? I do not know what is gained by cartoon depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. I don't think this advances a substantive discussion of the Islamic religion, including possibly some problems with the Islamic religion as a factor in world peace. As far as I can see, it's, a, it's an exercise in rights of expression that serves no useful purpose whatsoever. So somehow we need to think a little more clearly, and I don't mean this is a brand new thought, we need to think a little more clearly about subjecting certain rights to a litmus of common courtesy and decency. Um, and this would apply for, to, to other societies talking about aspects of our culture as well. It's not just a, a Western and American obligation. Now, when pressed, when pressed, I guess I still believe in the right of freedom of expression, and I fully, fully recognize the difficulties of beginning to erect informal barriers based on other people's sensitivities. We face this issue in college campuses with regard to what's called political correctness, so this is not a brand new problem. But I do think that in the interest of human dignity, we need to be able to urge practitioners not to press this particular exercise of expression to the extent of creating totally unproductive. I, I've seen no benefit result from this except dismay in Islam and, a, and an odd sense of defiance on the part of certain Westerners. I've seen no benefit from this. 
That's not the same thing as saying we should not discuss issues of religion. Substantive discussions are fair game, but symbolic manipulations strike me as something we should be arguing more clearly against. I don't see their utility. Okay, then here's the second problem. I'm a firm, I think the, the uh, advance of concepts of human rights are one of the really encouraging aspects of world history, particularly uh, since 1948 and, and uh, uh, the Charter. So I'm all for human rights, but we have a problem. And again, I can state the problem. It's not unfamiliar to you. I don't quite know how to work it out. Human rights are great, but when presented to some societies, they sound very much like Western neocolonialism. All right. Um, partly because, to a surprising extent, despite real efforts before the uh, 48 Charter to, to appeal to thinkers of a variety of of traditions around the world. Partly this is because the right statements, the, the formal right statements are in fact surprisingly individualistic. Um, partly it's because Americans perhaps particularly, but also uh, others in some of the um, uh, international NGOs, for example. Uh, Americans have seized on the opportunity to talk about human rights as an opportunity to lecture other societies in ways that smack of, well, you know, we're still superior to you. We're simply using different language, and you have to measure up to our standards. Um, studies suggest that our annual lectures to China about Chinese adherence to rights do more harm than good. Uh, they convince they will once in a while prod the Chinese to release one or two political prisoners, so I don't mean they're without any impact. But the studies I've seen argue that in the main, uh, these annual occasions simply anger Chinese leadership because to them, this is an affront to their dignity. This is an affront to the dignity of their society. This is a neglect of the tremendous advances Chinese society has made over the past several decades. It just seems to be a wrong way to frame the problem. So in advancing the cause of human dignity, I think we need to at least modify some of our policy approaches, even in domains like human rights that seem closest to the mark. We need to be more open, and this is something that Dr. Akeda has said as well, we need to be more open to collaborations with other societies about how human rights are best defined. The approach that was being urged in Singapore and China in the 1990s uh, toward greater recognition of the importance of community in human rights statements, the, the need to modify strict individualism is something we should listen to. Uh, we should be willing to dialogue with other societies about uh, human rights problems in our own society. There is obviously something ironic in our annual lectures to China and more recently to some African societies about their human rights abuses when we have the largest per capita prison population in the world. We need, we need, to, open, we need to open a dialogue, not to, not to, to, to neglect efforts to promote human rights, but I guess this is the bottom line, to promote human rights in ways that are more compatible with an appreciation of the dignity of human beings in other societies and the validity of other value systems. So these are the three challenges. The, ch the first challenge is simply to recognize that in trying to promote greater appreciation of human dignity in our foreign policy, we need to recognize uh, the, the extent to which we're trying to do something that has not been systematically accomplished previously. I think we continue to have a real issue in addressing global sensitivities about Western and American statements of superiority and nationalism, and we need to build this more clearly into our discourse. And as I say, I think we have some issues to discuss with regard not to the importance of human rights, but to the manner of their presentation and to the, uh, the, to the need to improve their compatibility with other aspects of human dignity. Okay, so we 
have been properly told, and I, I, I've learned a lot in thinking about this session and from the two previous speakers, we need certainly to approach the issue of greater, appreci greater appreciation for human dignity with a sense of personal responsibility. The process begins with self-restraint and possibly even self-transformation, and I accept that. Um, but we also need to figure out ways to promote principles of human dignity more systematically in discussions with others, not just about, not, not just about local issues, not just about personal practice, but about issues of more general policy. Human dignity has to be, and I say this fully recognizing the complexity of the statement, human dignity has to be partly a political issue. All right? we, live as, we live in a society currently, as you all know, and I'm not trying to take cheap political shots, in which some candidates for the presidency seem to score points by regularly assailing the dignity of other candidates and of large groups of people such as Mexican immigrants. And we seem to tolerate this in ways that surpass my imagination. We live in a society, and we were talking about this last night, we live in a society in which ram random uh, utilization of social media brings shame to people with no due process, with no possibility of address, leading in extreme cases to loss of job, loss of residence, and sometimes even to suicide, we have a problem. And it's partly a problem that needs to be addressed by a greater sense of courtesy, by the application of new standards of decorum to new venues such as social media. But it's also a problem that probably needs to be addressed through some degree of political discussion as part of our approach to foreign policy, as part of our approach to a return to a more civil society. So in addition then to the injunctions for personal transformation for dialogue, I think we have an injunction to figure out how better to integrate the need for dignity with some of our basic efforts in policy. Thanks a lot.